Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. (laughs) Welcome back to Dark Poutine. I am Mike Brown, creator and host. Across the table is co-host Matthew Stockton. Hello, Matthew. Hello, Mike. Hi, everybody. Someone recognized you and Steve again? In, in the pet food store. Isn't that funny? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, they, they recognize him more than me. Yeah, I don't mind that either. It's like, no, no, give all the attention yeah. to Steve. I'm good at that. <laughs> yeah. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate, Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. We heart emoji DP. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, DP means dark poutine, not that other thing. The dark poutine. Right. In the province of Quebec on April 15, 1763, after a supposed confession and hasty trial by an English military tribunal, 30-year-old Marie Josephette Corriveau was convicted of murdering in a brutal fashion her second husband, Louis-Étienne Dodier, and was sentenced to death. She was hanged just three days later. Her body was then put on display in a form-fitting metal cage and placed at a crossroad for the next five weeks, where she stood as a warning to others considering domestic homicide as an answer to an unhappy marriage. When her cage disappeared, locals believed that the devil himself had come and taken Marie Josephette to hell. Over the centuries, the legend of La Corvo has grown and many different versions of the story have been orally handed down, each one more fantastic with the telling, often demonizing the woman. Legend claims La Corvo was a powerful witch who murdered no less than seven of her husbands and her ghost haunts the crossroad at which her body was placed after her execution. Some say that where she was displayed, on some nights, you can hear La Corvo's metal cage creaking as it swings in the wind and if you listen carefully, you can also make out the rattling of her bones inside it. The facts of this fascinating and disturbing case have become twisted and grotesquely distorted, perhaps lost forever. However, it's worth another look, especially as more than 250 years later, historians have raised questions regarding the legality of Le Corvo's execution. Some believe she was convicted and punished wrongfully. You are listening to Dark Poutine, episode 216, the legend of La Corvo. There are numerous sources, some telling very conflicting stories about what actually occurred to cause the death of Louis Etienne Dodier. As the majority of these recountings are in French, and I am an Anglophone with only a shadowy recollection of high school French, I employed translation software to help with my research, so it might not be perfect. I found the book. Once Upon a Hundred Times, La Corvo, a 1995 anthology written by French author Nicole Guibault, the most helpful, and borrowed it from the library at the Internet Archive. I didn't know you could do that, so I borrowed a book from there. Kind of cool. Guibault's aptly named book includes many oral and literary accounts of the story, with varying takes on the tale. As well, the book contains attempts by historians to piece together the real story of Le Corvo from preserved official documents and journals from the time. 
If you can read French, you may enjoy reading Guibault's book, as it expands a great deal on what we are able to present here in this podcast. Marie Josephette Corriveau, later known simply as La Corriveau, was born either in January or February of 1733 in the parish of saint valier del Balchasse in what was then called New France. The tight-knit rural community sat on the St. Lawrence, just northeast of Quebec City and just across the river from Ile d'Orléans. It is said that Marie Josephette's parents, Joseph Corriveau and Marie-Francois Bolduc, did have ten other children, and although well-off, Marie Josephette was the only one who survived into adulthood. That was quite common back then, wasn't it? For all the children to die? For a lot of them. Like mm-hmm. I was I was looking this up, right? And yeah. I think in the seventeen hundreds, mm-hmm. something like more than half of children born didn't make it to their first year. Wow. And the and then more than half of those yeah didn't make it to 10 wow yeah and some historians are saying that parents actually resisted making <laughs> imagine this resisted making large emotional investments in their children until they demonstrated their ability to survive wow yeah. so it's like oh that kid that we had yeah yeah, if it's viable we'll like it yeah and a lot of children were you know they'd have a kid name <laughs> name or mary yeah it, it, unfortunately, Mary does. They just keep on naming their next daughter Mary until until, yeah. until there's a Mary that yeah. takes. I mean, it would have been a hard time to live, but I mean, that's that was just the reality of life, wasn't it? Yeah, and a lot of those, uh, a lot of families in those days had a lot of children to build a workforce as yeah. well. Yeah. So you know, and uh, there was also the Catholic idea of populating the planet planet yep. with Catholics. Right. So okay. Yeah, pretty fascinating, but it's sad that only one of them made it. I know, it's horrible. At 16, Marie Josephette married a local farmer named Charles Bouchard. It is said that the marriage between the couple was a happy union that later bore three children. First came two daughters, Marie Francois, named after her maternal grandmother in 1752, and Marie Angelique in 1754, and then a son, Charles Jr., in 1757. In the spring of 1760, Charles Sr. came down with a fever and was bedridden, eventually passing away sometime in the final week of April. He was buried at the local cemetery on April 27, 1760, leaving Marie Josephette, a 27-year-old widow with three children, all under 10 years old, to raise on her own. It didn't take long after Bouchard's death before Marie Josephette was in the arms of another man, another young farmer and bachelor from saint Valier, Louis-Étienne Dodier. Locals gossiped about Marie-Josephette's romance with Dodier, calling it inappropriate, as she had not observed the traditional period of mourning after Bouchard's death before becoming involved with him. According to historian Jerry Walton on her site, jerrywalton.com, French mourning in the 1700s was a well-laid-out affair and everyone in polite society was expected to participate. Quote, Great mourning was attached to the loss of a father, mother, grandfather, grandmother, sibling, or spouse, and was called full mourning. Full mourning was further divided into three classes, woolen, silk, and half mourning, and mourning also had two distinct colors, white or black. Black was the primary color chosen for the expression of this French mourning and the silent herald of sufferings. The color black was strongly expressive of the privation of life and a symbol of the privation of light. When a wife mourned her husband, it lasted a year and six weeks. Four and a half months in mourning clothes, the cloak, gown, and petticoat of French fluff, four weeks and a half in crepe and woolen, three months in silk and gauze, and six weeks in half mourning. Although Marie, Josephette, and Louis were married a full 15 months after Charles Bouchard's passing, well outside the expected period of mourning, Many in St. Valier resented the union of the couple. She was a widow and damaged goods. The marriage had taken an eligible bachelor off the market, thus depriving some of the more, quote, deserving young women of their own marriage to someone like Dodier. The talk was that Marie and Louis had been meeting in secret for some time starting soon after Charles passed. There are also accounts indicating that the resentment and mistrust of the Corovo family ran deeper and was older than Marie's moral offenses, 
as the family was better off than many of the others in the community. Those people, like the Korovos, were under British rule, but they seemed to be suffering more than the Korovo clan. There is zero evidence of any collusion between the Korovo family and the British after the fall of New France. Tall poppy syndrome is a more likely cause. Here in Canada, that is something that has plagued us societally from the earliest times and into today. Tall poppy syndrome, according to tallestpoppy.ca, quote, occurs when people are attacked, resented, disliked, criticized, or cut down because of their achievements and or success. I can verify the continued existence of these sentiments. I think that maybe the, the whole tall poppy syndrome mm -hmm. is slightly more Canadian thing than American thing. Oh, for sure. You know, if, if you think about it historically, Americans are like homesteaders. Yeah. But up in Canada, we're kind of fort people, yep. right? We lived in forts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you know how we say A all the time? Yeah. Do you know what that is? No. It's a request for consensus, if you think about it. Oh, interesting. It's like, and we say sorry all the time. It's to keep the peace. I don't think those are actually weird quirks of language. I think it's kind of been ingrained from our history. Yeah, it's like a cultural thing. It's a Canadian cultural thing. Yeah. Thanks to our living together in forts. Yeah, and I and that, so I think Canadians are much more communally minded. This is like broad brush strokes, right? Right, yeah. But Americans, I think, tended to in the past celebrate individual success more than Canadians did. Yeah, you have written here, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And... Was the USA slogan in Canada. It's actually, the official one is peace, order, and good government. <laughs> yeah. It's not not nearly as, as, as exciting. But... It's not nearly as fun. But at the same time, if you look at the U.S., they call themselves a melting pot, mm -hmm. whereas we don't, but... Cultural mosaic. Yeah, cultural mosaic. That's that's interesting. It's like, we don't want you to become this uh, homogenous one thing, yeah. which is Canadian. We want you to be who you are, which is Canadian. But believe in the cultural mosaic. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's pretty fascinating. Yeah. The marriage between Louis and Marie Josephette began to sour publicly and the negative gossip about them increased. Louis and Marie had been seen arguing loudly and being physical with one another. It was rumored that Marie was drinking heavily, which led to serious arguments between she and Louis. Marie claimed Louis was berating and beating her regularly. After 18 months of marriage, Marie Josephette petitioned the court to leave Louis' home, but her request was denied. The Corvo woman was reaping what she sowed, the neighborhood gossips said. Around the same time, according to the book Uncertain Justice by F. Murray Greenwood and Beverly Boissery, adding to the matrimonial grief, there were ongoing financial stresses between Louis and his father-in-law, Joseph. The two had entered into a number of contracts on Louis' marriage to Marie Josephette, which included the shared ownership of a horse and rental of a house right next door to Joseph's in which Marie and Louis were living. The situation escalated between the two men, and they began having physical altercations on their properties requiring the intervention of the area's British commanding officer, Major James Abercrombie. At the time, British military policed the area, and when required, military tribunals dealt with legal matters both criminal and civil. Corvo complained to Abercrombie that Dodier had not paid the rent on his house and wouldn't allow Corvo to ride the shared mare and was keeping her sequestered in his barn. Ooh, Mike, let's go back in time and start an app and call it call it Mare Share. Mare Share. And where you can just book the book the mare. I was thinking horser with <laughs> just an R instead of ER, it just an R. I like Mare Share. Mare Share. Mare Share is cute. <laughs> well, it would piss me off though if someone didn't share my horse. You know, I know. I want to ride the horse. Give me the horse to ride. I've paid for half of this bloody horse. Yeah. It's, it's mine to ride. It's like, you know, I use the moto car share service here. Yeah. And sometimes when people are late, you get, you get kind of testy. Oh. Yeah. Well, yeah. Hopefully don't kill them. No. <laughs> From Uncertain Justice. Abercrombie would later say that he believed that the old man was generally in the wrong. This belief may have influenced him when Marie, claiming constant physical abuse by Dodier, unsuccessfully petitioned for permission to leave her husband. By January 1763, the Major had had enough. Angrily frustrated by the time-consuming petty quarrels and sordid domestic disputes, he threatened to fine the next guilty man $20, a very large sum for the time. 
chancing upon the major on January 26, 1763, Joseph Corvo complained that Dodier had assaulted him and therefore should pay the $20. What was more, this time it was not his word against his son-in-law's. He had a witness to the attack. Not surprisingly, Abercrombie refused to do anything until he had a chance to question Dodier and Corvo's witnesses. Outraged by the major's inaction, Corvo repeated his charge and when Abercrombie would not change his mind, he stomped off in disgust, ominously muttering that some misfortune will happen. End quote. The very next day, January 27, 1763, 28-year-old Louis Etienne Dodier's body was found by a neighbor in his stables. Word of the death spread quickly, and curious neighbors gathered around the body to see what was left of poor Louis. As the country was under military rule, Jacques Corriveau, a relative of Joseph's and a captain of the local militia, attended. Upon seeing the state of Louis, he called for the local priest, Thomas Blondeau, to come as well and bless the dead man. Captain Corvo assembled ten witnesses who had seen Dodier's body and a coroner's report was written by ten o'clock that morning, only three hours after the discovery of the horrific scene. Many believe that Joseph Corvo had made good on his threats of violence on Louis Dodier, including Major Abercrombie, but the official documents filed initially by Jacques Corvo said differently. They read, Quote, in the year 1763, on January 27, at 7 o'clock in the morning, I was called to examine the body of Louis Dodier, who was killed in his stable by his horse, and I was then accompanied by a number of neighbors, all of whom declared that they had seen and examined the body of said Louis Dodier, still under the feet of his horses, and that he had received several blows to the head. This is what the persons mentioned above declared on the day at the time indicated, as written above, some having signed. This report bore only two signatures, that of Jacques Corvo, militia captain and relative of Joseph, who was acting as coroner, and that of Paul Georges, one of the witnesses. Major Abercrombie of the 78th British Regiment accepted the report and wrote, quote, I am sorry for the accident, but seeing the testimony of so many persons, I conclude he was killed by one of his horses, so that there is nothing to be done but bury him, end quote. The coffin was constructed in haste, and according to the burial certificate in the registrars of St. Valier, Louis Dodier was buried that same evening. Only days later, many pieces of Louis's estate had been catalogued, divided up, and auctioned to the highest and last bidder, with all proceeds going to Marie Josephette Corriveau. People continued to talk, of course. Some were suspicious that Louis had been buried too quickly. A few of the witnesses getting wind of the contents of the coroner's report were disturbed, saying it did not accurately represent what they'd seen. The body had been lying in manure, sure, which might have obscured any wounds other than the obvious. There was also mention that some of the horses were not in the stables at the time of the discovery of Louis's body. They'd been outside, and they were not shod. The wounds, presumed to have come from a horse bearing heavy horseshoes, could not have been inflicted by Louis's horses. The wounds, said one of the witnesses, looked as though they were made by something sharp. Had Jacques Corvo and Father Thomas Blondeau covered up a murder, or were they simply not up to the sometimes complex task of death investigation? Isabella Sylvan, niece to Joseph Corvo and a servant in his home, at one point claimed that while she was up tending to toilet-related business in the middle of the night, she'd overheard Joseph get up and leave the house on the night of Louis's death. She also claimed in a contradictory statement later on that she'd heard a commotion in the stables next door as though the horses were being beaten, which would keep with the stomp by horses theory. Isabella's story changed again in a third interview. Marie's story was changing with every telling as well about who was where and who was doing what when. Louis's family was certain that he'd been murdered, and Major Abercrombie grew suspicious. Fed up, and wanting to get to the bottom of the whole affair, Major Abercrombie applied to Governor Murray to have poor Louis Dodier exhumed for a closer look at his body. Permission was granted, and only days after Louis had been buried, he was again unearthed, and a doctor from the 78th Regiment named George Fraser examined him. Fraser's findings, signed on February 14, 1763, are as follows. Upon examining the body of Louis Dodier, I found two wounds in his face, 
one near his upper lip, which penetrated through the flesh and upper jaw, the one other, a little before the eye, which was about four inches deep. Two other wounds on the left side of his head fractured his skull. His lower jaw was fractured without a wound. The wounds in his face and head were about three inches from each other. I am of the opinion that these wounds were the cause of the man's death, signed George Fraser. Dr. Fraser further stated that the wounds came from two different blows and could not have been caused by the kicking of a horse, even one that had been shod. It appeared to have been a homicide. Abercrombie had Joseph and Marie-Josephette Corriveau arrested and held on suspicion of the murder of Louis-Étienne Dodier. It was suspected that Joseph, at his daughter's urging, and with plenty of his own reasons, had murdered Louis in cold blood. The father and daughter were held in the local stockade, pending a swift trial. And we'll take a break right here. And we are back. Matthew, thoughts on this episode so far? The mob rule is coming, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, it's funny, you know, I was, I was listening to you there and, and forensic of the, of the 1700s, I think you have to take the word, I don't think you said the word, but like forensics very loosely back then. Right? I don't dare say the word forensics and, in this episode. And doctor's opinions. Ian, you have to remember that, you know, mm -hmm. this, this doctor in the 1700s would not have his license today. <laughs> It's, it's, it's things have just moved on. Well, he'd be more concerned with the humors yeah. of, of the people <laughs> and, and putting leeches on them, etc. Yeah. yeah, so it's just fascinating. I think people tried their hardest sometimes. I don't know if they did here. Mm -hmm. um, the honest ones would have tried their hardest, but there was so much room for um, just making shit up. Yeah. If you wanted to get somebody thrown oh, sure. in jail. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, she weighs more than a duck. Yeah. So she's a witch. <laughs> Oh, but we'll get into that later. Jeez. In the meantime, locals began to speculate that marie Josephette Corriveau may have been responsible for the murder of her first husband also. It was unclear to many how the man had died, and the rumor was that marie Josephette had dispatched Charles in his sleep by pouring hot molten lead into his ear, effectively melting his brain. Their speedy but dramatic murder and conspiracy trial in front of the military tribunal began on Tuesday, March 29, 1763, and continued until April 6, allowing for the community to observe Easter and including Good Friday and Easter Monday as days off. It was held in one of the rooms in the nearby monastery as the local courtroom was too small to contain the accused, counsel from both sides, the members of the tribunal, and all 24 witnesses. Timelines of who was there when on the night of January 26 were murky at best. Everyone present in either home seemed to be telling a different story. Isabella Sylvan's testimony about hearing Joseph arise and go out was questioned by the defense. She was all over the place. Finally, she broke down and denied all of her previous assertions, saying that she had only testified under the influence of fear of both the British, who'd questioned her, and was torn by her loyalty to Joseph Corvo and the family. For this reason, she was later prosecuted and condemned as a perjurer. When Captain Jacques Corvo testified, he dropped a bombshell. He and the priest, Father Blondeau, had conspired to cover up Louis's murder to avoid shame for his family being involved in such a thing. The captain continued to throw his cousin under the bus, reminding everyone of Joseph's mumblings to he and the priest on the day before the murder that Louis Dodier was about to suffer some great misfortune. More damning testimony to Joseph came by way of hearsay. One of the witnesses present on the morning of the discovery of the body raised concerns about the public rancor between Joseph and Louis, seen in the days leading up to Louis's death. Joseph Corvo was livid and apparently said, quote, That's it, let them arrest me and hang me. I am not a runaway, I shall not dishonor my family. End quote. I don't know if that's a confession, but whatever. Marie Josephette's reputation was dragged through the mud as well. One local man, Claude Dion, testified claiming he knew Marie Josephette had killed her first husband with a metal curry comb, a brush used to groom horses. The defense lawyer debunked this, saying that Charles was known to have died thanks to a putrid fever. Dion continued, though, 
saying he'd seen Marie Josephet arguing violently with Louis on several occasions and that she had said she would pay any price to be rid of her husband. The tribunal was also told that, worst of all, Marie was a chronic alcoholic. According to the book Uncertain Justice, Marie, quote, was much addicted to drunkenness and to, quote, such a degree Dion had seen her spewing her children's caps and she sold everything to procure liquor, end quote. Joseph did not testify in his own defense, but hoping to introduce reasonable doubt as to Joseph's guilt, his lawyers named others who had grudges against Louis Dodier. After closing arguments on April 6, 1763, the tribunal was ready to rule. The president of the court, Roger Morris, lieutenant colonel of the 47th Regiment, pronounced that all parties charged were guilty. He wrote, I hereby ratify and confirm the foregoing sentences that Joseph Corvo has been found guilty of the murder of his son-in-law Dodier, shall be hanged. Marie Josephette Corvo, alias Dodier, has been found guilty of knowing of said murder, shall receive 60 lashes at three different places, under the gallows, upon the marketplace of Quebec, and at St. Vallier, 20 at each place, and she shall be branded on the left hand with the letter M. Isabel Silvan has been found guilty of perjury, shall receive thirty lashes, ten in the same manner, and at the same time and places as Widow Dodier, and she shall be branded on the left hand with the letter P. So this whole idea of branding, to me, is really disturbing, Matthew. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, a letter P for perjurer, uh, a letter M for, what, assistant to murder, I right. guess. Uh, yeah. But... We've, we all know about, you mentioned earlier, uh, when we weren't... The Scarlet Letter. The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Now, I haven't read the book, but, you know, that was a branding, just, she had to wear that on her outfit, but... Yeah, something, yeah. Was, yeah, but maybe, was, maybe that what really happened was the actual branding. I mean, there were weird things, like B for blasphemy, and T on the hand for thief, SL on the cheek for seditious liable, um... R for rogue or vagabond, F for forgery, uh, for forgery, and interestingly, something that I would have been branded with, um, the letter D for on my dick. on my chest for drunkenness. <laughs> okay. D for drunkenness. So if you were a drunk, wow, you were branded. Did they have one for the gays? I don't see one for the gays. I think they they just killed us. I think. Gays were just murdered. <laughs> yes. Outright. Woo! The good old days. <laughs> the, the Jesus. <laughs> I'm totally being sarcastic. Yeah. L let's not make anything great again. No. No. <laughs> yeah. The sentences ratified by Governor Murray were to be carried out seven days later as the gallows had to be built. On the night before his hanging, Joseph summoned his confessor. He did not want to admit to the crime. He had another story to tell. He was ready to reveal what he claimed had actually occurred on the night of Louis's death. He couldn't bear the guilt of his knowledge anymore. Joseph said that on the evening of January 26, between 9 and 10 o'clock, Marie had come next door to see her father, already in bed, and had whispered something in his ear. His daughter had told him that Louis was dead and that she'd killed him with a blunted hatchet as he'd slept. Joseph angrily told his daughter to go home and then told his wife what had happened. Marie came back again in the middle of the night, begging her father to help move Louis's body. Joseph admitted he'd done that, but he'd not killed Louis, nor had he any prior knowledge or had been involved in any of the planning of his son-in-law's death. Uh, okay. So do you think he's kind of going, oh, I'm in trouble here. I'm going to throw her under the bus. I don't know. I don't know. It may have really happened the way that he said. Right. Um, and maybe, maybe his conscience really did get to him at the end. And it was just like, yeah, you know what? I'm not going to keep my mouth shut anymore. You know, she was the only daughter that he had that survived yeah. into adulthood. And maybe he didn't want to see what he knew was going to happen as a result of his confession happen, but he couldn't take himself out at the same time. Mm. So, yeah, I don't know. It's really, really tough to, to say if his motives were true. Because, you know, it's the night before my execution. 
hmm, is there, is there someone else maybe I can blame for this? Maybe. I don't know how I'm going to react. I mean, a good dad would have been like, I did it. She wasn't involved. Instead, he did the opposite. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe a good dad is the one that, like him, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. You know, I would, I would take the blame for Steve any day. Would you? Yeah. <laughs> sure. Governor Murray was informed of the confession, and it was recounted to him by Joseph shortly after. Marie Josephette was dragged out of her cell where she awaited her own sentence. Marie admitted that what Joseph had said was true. She alone had killed Louis. She said that after her father had helped her move the body to the stable, she'd cleaned up the crime scene. This included burning the bloodied bedsheets from the bed in which she'd murdered her husband. The other members of both households, including Marie's own children and her mother, corroborated some of the movements of Marie Josephette and her father on the evening in question. Everything seemed to come together. Joseph was given the stay of execution pending the results of a second trial which took place on April 14, 1763. Marie Josephette pleaded guilty to her husband's murder, again reiterating that her father had not been involved. Why do you think she pled guilty at this point? Maybe tired? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or, yeah, like We've tired seen of that keeping before, the secret. False yeah. confessions. People just get worn down and want it over with sometimes. Mm -hmm. But maybe she really did what maybe she, she did. was accused yeah. of. I mean, maybe she was tired of keeping that secret. Maybe she was, uh, okay, dad said this. I feel so badly about what he said to about me. I'm just, I just want to die. The jig is up, sort of thing. Well, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Following the tribunal's findings of guilt, the order was issued. Quebec, 15 April, 1763, General Order. The court-martial, whereof Lieutenant Colonel Morris was president, dissolved. The general court-martial, having tried Marie Josephette Corvo for the murder of her husband, Dodier, in the court, finding her guilty. The governor, Murray, doth ratify and confirm the following sentence, that Marie Josephette Corvo do suffer death for the same and her body to be hung in chains wherever the governor shall think fit. Signed, Thomas Mills, T. Major, Quebec. Dated same. Joseph was released and later received a pardon from King George III. According to some, Marie got off easy with a sentence of hanging, as at the time, burning at the stake was also possible punishment for petite treason, the murder of a husband by a wife. Authorities carried out the sentence three days later, with the public hanging of the young woman in Quebec City, near the Plains of Abraham. As the execution orders directed, Marie Josephette's body was gibbeted at Point Levy at the crossroads of Luzon and Bienville, around 30 kilometers from saint Valier de Bellechasse. According to Samantha Priestley's book, The History of Gibbeting, Britain's Most Brutal Punishment, quote, Gibbeting was a horrific form of torture when performed on live criminals, and a gruesome spectacle when performed following execution, as it was in this case. The body was placed in a tight cage of chains or irons that fitted the body perfectly and was then hung from a 20 to 30 foot high wooden post. Gibbet cages were made individually and no two were the same. None were removed before the body had decayed and all that was left was bones and dust, end quote. There were some famous cases of gibbeting throughout history by British courts, Probably the best known are gibbetings of pirates, like Captain William Kidd, whose treasure, some presume, is that which is buried in the money pit in Nova Scotia's Oak Island. Shameless plug, you can read more about the money pit in my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem. Oh my god, do you remember last week when I was going on about how I heard this thing about Oak Island and it was really fascinating and you were like, yeah, that was my book? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh my god, it was. <laughs> yes, it was my book. I was, guys, I was going on about like this great story and totally forgot that it was out of Mike's book. And I don't know why it took so long to get these numbers, but I got the numbers for the first two months of sales right. for my book. And uh, in two months, from November 2nd till the end of December, uh, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem sold 15,000 copies. Wow. Yeah, wow. I, I know probably... 12,000 of those are you because you <laughs> no, I bought, bought. I bought 10. But uh, yeah, like uh, <laughs> uh, thank you to everybody who bought a copy. And 
hopefully you're still buying copies because that uh, I'm not making money yet. Buy one for your left hand and one for your right hand. Yeah, you could do that. <laughs> Marie Josephette's body was hung at the busy crossroad in its iron cage as a warning to other would-be murderers for five weeks after her execution. Hung high, animals on the ground were unable to get to the cage, but there were accounts of crows pecking away at her as she decayed, covered in maggots and surrounded by flies. Passers-by said the stench was unbearable. It was during this time that the legend of La Coravo began growing. There were, quote, reports of unusual goings-on at the site. Some claimed as they wandered by, unable to look away, Marie Josephette would open her eyes, which glowed red. A few, claiming they'd ventured too close, claimed the corpse's rotting arms had reached out for them angrily. When the cage suddenly disappeared 40 days after it had been placed at the crossroads, some locals assumed that Le Corvo's true husband, none other than Lucifer, the devil himself, had come to take his wife, now being called a witch, back to hell with him. According to Spooky Canada's defunct blog, there have been reports in the area of, quote, moans, cold spots, odors of decay, and the feeling of being watched by something malevolent, end quote. Collective guilt. Yeah. I think that's what's happening here. If her body just been whisked away and buried, mm -hmm. out of sight, out of mind, right? Yeah. But, um... You know, all these people are spreading rumors and doing this and that. You know, with the body hanging up there, it's sort of like this big, you did this to me with your rumors and lies statement. Yeah. Right? Yep. Yeah, and, and it's like people start to wonder, oh my gosh, did we do right by this lady kind yeah. of thing? You know, maybe we resented her because she came from a more wealthy family than us or whatever, but did she deserve what she got? Probably mm. not. Yeah. And, you know, as far as today's justice goes, absolutely not. <laughs> Did she deserve what she got? Yeah. So, yeah. What is presumed to be the cage of La Coravo, with what is assumed to be her bones still inside, was found in 1851 in the ground in the cemetery of St. Joseph de Levy. During a planned expansion of that graveyard, the cage was uncovered. Soon after... The cage was stolen from the church cellar and apparently acquired by the American impresario P.T. Barnum and put on display as a macabre object. In 2006, the metal cage used for Marie Josephette's gibbeting was found by chance and authenticated after being lost for nearly 160 years. The artifact was sitting in a storage room at the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts. It was repatriated to Quebec City in 2015 and integrated into the permanent collection of the Musée de la Civilisation in Quebec, where it remains to this day. According to Atlas Obscura, Corvo's gibbet is still being tested and studied to see if they might even be able to pull DNA from it. In 1863, a hundred years after Marie Josephette's execution, author Philippe Aubert de Gaspé published his book, Les Anciens Canadiens, and this book included a fantastical story of La Coravo, adding to her growing legend as an otherworldly entity. A man named Francois Dubé claimed to have passed the infamous crossroads one night when he heard what he described as a strange tic-tac sound behind him. He did not look back to see what it was, but suddenly, at the moment when he least expected it, he felt two large dry hands like bear claws, grabbing him by his shoulders. He turned around and was terrified to find himself face to face with La Corvo, still in her cage and now trying to climb onto his back. Her rotted arms clung to him, but the cage was heavy, and with every attempt to climb onto him, she shook and fell to the ground with a horrible noise, refusing to let go of the terrified man who later said he was so frightened he could hear himself sweating. The thing then spoke to him. Le Corvo asked him to please take her to dance with her friends, other witches holding a black magic ceremony on Ile de Orlan. She said, I need your help. It is impossible for me to cross the St. Lawrence, which is a blessed river, without the help of a Christian. End quote. According to the magazine Canada's History, Francois claimed he could hear the witches holding their rights on the island and shouting at him, Are you coming, lazy dog? Bring our friend to us. We have 14,400 rounds to make before 
the crowing of the cock, and we have to leave. La Caravaux tells Dubé, well, if you won't carry me there, I will strangle you and I will get to the Sabbath by riding on your soul. And that she does. Francois, however, doesn't die. He loses consciousness and wakes up in the morning in a muddy trench near the road. He struggles up and finds his bottle of fire water nearby. He wants to take a sip, but it's empty. Apparently, the witch had drunk it all. And there we are. I was waiting for this. The, she's a witch. Yeah. It's any woman who didn't fall neatly into the role of wife and mother back then. Yeah. Was practically cast as a witch. Oh, for sure. I mean, you know, what horrible woman wanted to live a life of her own? Oh, God yeah. forbid. God forbid that she would want to, you know, have a business <laughs> and make decisions for herself and wow. all of those kind of things. Uh as they say, down with the patriarchy, I guess. <laughs> the story of Le Corvo is popular in French-Canadian folklore, and there are many different versions of it than the ones that you've heard here. It has morphed throughout the years, growing further away from what actually happened and into things more supernatural. The story of Le Corvo has inspired artists, writers, poets, and filmmakers, and many of them. But most interesting, to me at least, are the stories told by the locals. Albert Roy, who was 98 years old and from saint vallier de bellechasse told historian Suzanne Chaloux in 1976 about his memories of the story as told to him by his parents when he was a boy. He said that when it was windy, Le Corvo's bones had made noise against her iron cage. In a telling of the legend collected in 1979 by Ariane Array, as told to Willie Mercier, 66, from saint Raphael de bellechasse this recounting leaves out the facts that she was dead before she was placed in the cage. He said, In saint Vallier de Bellechasse, at the time known to be well hard, there were people who feared neither God nor devil. La Coravo was first married. She killed her first husband. She married again, and her second husband is dead too. So they took her and she went to court where La Coravo admitted she'd kill her husbands. So they put her in a wire basket and hung her on a post. And everyone who passed her there shouted to her, Le Corvo, my accursed, Le Corvo, my accursed. You killed your husbands. You murdered your husbands. But once they got home, it wasn't so funny. They had been there to taunt her, but when they got home, all sorts of misfortunes happened and they were prey to bad luck. The affected people went to see the priest and told him all about it. They said to him, Father, we were laughing at Le Corvo. The priest replied, You just couldn't leave her alone. Now you must suffer your fate. This, Mercier claimed, is where the legend of Corvo comes from, according to his family at least. In some accounts, the number of Le Corvo's murdered husbands expands to seven. Some claim that Le Corvo put an evil hex on everyone who dared make a home in the area in which she'd been gibbeted. There are still signs of her, especially in the evening. One can hear groans coming from the crossroad. Phantom knocks can be heard on the doors of the residents in the middle of the night, and when they answer, they find no visitor present. Things mysteriously go missing, and when the wind blows just right, the smell of Le Corvo's rotting corpse can be detected so strongly, people have to close their windows. All that aside, did the law get it right, or was Marie Josephette Corvo wrongly convicted? This year, historians Dave Corvo and Catherine Furland published a book written in French called La Corvo, in which they hope to unravel some of the mysteries surrounding this case. Author Catherine Furlan told the French language paper Le Clarier Progrès, quote, We only saw the dark side of this character until the 1950s. Even today it is not known if she was really guilty, because the trial did not contain any solid evidence. She would never have been convicted in the current justice system, end quote. Or would she? Well, I don't know. OJ got away with it, but yeah, he did. Yeah, we've seen some dodgy uh Dodgy outcomes. convictions, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, here in Canada, we I did the epi we did the episode uh, on Donald Marshall, who was the indigenous man in Nova Scotia who was convicted of the murder of Sandy Seal, who was his friend. Mm. Uh, and it turned out, you know, 11 years later, they found out it was this old white dude who did it. Mm. You know, so... Indigenous, indigenous guy kills black guy was the story, mm. but it was actually white guy did the deed and ran away. Yeah. And indigenous guy get, get blamed. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, yeah. 
perhaps she would have been convicted today. Perhaps. Despite his last name, Dave Corvo says that he has no direct relationship with Marie Josephette Corvo. On the other hand, Jacques Corvo, the militia captain, was my ancestor, confirms the historian from Saint Marie. Well, I guess they were cousins, so that I don't know. I don't know how this all works. Uh, and comments Matthew on this episode. I think there's a bit of a lesson here. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a few. There's a few. I mean, I, I, so I'm fascinated with this idea of the mob rule back then all the time, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and people, hey, I think this happened. And, and, you know, I often see posts on social media, right? Yeah. And with current cases where essentially a digital mob, mm -hmm. right, starts piling in with their opinions before any of the facts are really established or, or people who, oh, I just know, right? I just know he did it or right. I just know that this is, this is why or I just know that. And it's sort of even more exponentialized. It's not even people within a community. It becomes this like global, nas yeah. national or global thing like that you'll notice one thing I've never, I'm on social media a lot. One thing I never do Mm -hmm. is ever comment on a current case because I don't know the facts. No, but and I'm, and I'm, I'm not going to post if somebody that, that I think somebody's guilty or not. And, and we have to give people their fair due. Well, and that's why I've struggled with, um, unsolved cases, doing yeah. unsolved cases, because I like to, I don't like that speculation. I actually loathe that part of because the there can always crime. be a plot twist at the end yeah. that breaks it open and something completely different happened. Mm -hmm. Right. But that there is a really strong element in the true crime community that fosters that sort of behavior. And I really do not like it. I don't like it either. Yeah. So if <laughs> I'm hoping that this show never does that, that this show never makes somebody speculate in a way that is like unfair to somebody else, Yeah. you know, because... I, I try to do only the oldy timey ones where people are 300 years dead and we can, we can, it doesn't <laughs> well, matter anymore. Like this one. Right. Yeah. Well, La Corvo might come back to haunt us. Mm -hmm. You might be walking to your car and feel her, her desiccated hands grab you and, from her cage. What a creepy scene. Like what a creepy thing, uh, creepy scenario that would a be. A skeleton in a cage behind you. Yeah. Behind you, just grabbing you and saying, take me to the witches. Oh, yo, yo. Take me to the river. Yeah. Well, that's what she wanted. Yeah. The St. Lawrence. And I guess it's time to move on to voicemail. Voicemails. He mumbled that. <laughs> that's right. It's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at 1 877 327 5786 or 1 877 D A R K P T N. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. All right. Here, I do believe, is our first voicemail of this episode. Hi guys, my name is Ash and I'm from the always born town of Ottawa. I've been listening to the show for just over two years now. I think my family's getting a little sick of me talking about you guys, to be honest with you. I'm starting to get caught up with uh, the release dates, which is bittersweet speak, uh, because soon I won't be able to binge watch uh, or listen three episodes or four episodes in one sitting. I know others have brought this up uh, in, in the past, but episode 10 regarding Mike's monster was probably one of the most important episodes I've listened to. Um, the night I heard that episode, I was actually preparing to face my own monster in court that week. And in that moment, I felt so comforted and uh, not alone, oddly enough, even though I've never met you guys and everything. <laughs> um, but yeah. So I just want to say thank you that you were so open. I emailed you guys about this. I don't know if you got it. But that episode I know means a lot to many people. Um, <laughs> and I do have to agree with you that a lot of people probably tend to be more interested in true crime because it is comforting. 
I myself am a survivor of a few events and situations, so hearing other people's stories kind of is related to me. It's interesting. Either way, before I start ranting, I just wanted to say that I love the show so much. You guys make my days and nights. Matthew is an awesome addition to the show and one hell of a writer. Mike, I love your book so much, and I can't wait to see what else you create. I love seeing how the show is growing, and I keep recommending you guys to my friends. So with love from Ottawa, go shit in your hats. (laughs) Bye, guys. Yay, Ash. Wow. Uh, Yep, I still get a lot of email, and we get some voicemails about episode 10, and yeah, that was a... I'm really glad I did it. I'm glad I did that episode and told that story about what happened to me when I was a a wee one. And interestingly, um, I'm still kind of doing some stuff while Matthew and I are at CrimeCon on the Friday morning, I will be uh, attending a virtual conference with the Edmonton police to talk to them Mm -hmm. about being, um, to tell them my story about what happened to me Mm -hmm. on that night because, and the aftermath, because it's important for police to hear how badly something can go with just some really silly or maybe nonchalant decisions Mm -hmm. made about an individual and what happened to them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's pretty, I'm great. I'm grateful that I get an opportunity to do something good with that story. Thanks for calling Ash and a a big hello to your whole fam jam from Mike and I. Yeah. They're sick of hearing. (laughs) hearing about us uh, you should just play the show to really loudly <laughs> anyway i'm glad that uh my voice could give you some comfort in that moment that really means a lot to me all right let's listen to uh voicemail and number two. Oh, this one's a long one oh hello uh mike and matthew um this is meg green um i uh I'm just uh, calling about, um, I, I was just finished listening to the Innisfail bombing episode, um, and uh, I thought I would call in because I am a defense lawyer, and uh, I thought uh, you were trolling for defense lawyers to call in, so here I am, lucky <laughs> you. Um, I have been uh, enjoying this podcast for a few months now. Um, it helps me with my uh, my commute from um, Windsor, Nova Scotia to Bridgewater, Nova Scotia, uh, I actually work in Bridgewater, Nova Scotia as a legal aid lawyer, um, and a good chunk of my practice is uh, in criminal defense work. Um, I know you had asked uh, whether or not um, we have a choice as to uh, continuing to represent someone if they have uh, basically admitted to us that they've committed the alleged crime. Uh, And I can say, and I'm only speaking for legal aid, though, but uh, if we feel there is a um, breakdown in solicitor-client relationship, we um, are able to potentially withdraw from the situation. Um, We do not, however, um, have the ability to tell anybody about anything that's been said because of solicitor-client privilege. I will say that I've been doing this for a little while, and nobody yet has said, I've done it, try to get me off. Um, if somebody has done it, uh, they usually say, I, I've done it, and um, let's try to resolve things with the Crown um, to get a sentence that's um, you know, going to work for everybody. So most of, most of the matters are resolved. Um, you know, very few things become these dramatic, uh, uh, exciting, or, uh, lack, or not exciting, <laughs> or whatever the case may be, um, from the perspective of people that watch stuff on TV or know how things go. It's pretty mundane, to be honest, on a day-to-day basis. But however, I do appreciate you saying um, that uh, we have a job to do. It's true. We are often vilified. Um, Unfairly, I think everybody deserves uh, the right to be represented. And a lot of the times, our clients are people with mental health issues and addiction issues. And, um, you know, a lot of the crimes are just, you know, the, the things that these people find themselves in and, and do to survive. Um, so uh, I feel we do an important job, and uh, that's all I wanted to say. So go and shit in your hat. Thank you very much. Bye. Well, th- there you go. Thank you for calling me. Thank you so that, much for that, calling. And uh, she does uh, defense lawyering in Bridgewater. 
<laughs> which I'm thinking, I wonder how, where you're from. And she's that's exactly where I'm from. And I'm wondering, I wonder if she's defended friends of <laughs> friends of mine. No, but that's great. I mean, she she's just pointed at something there. Like I, in my imagination, mm -hmm. I, like I'm always like, you know, it's the the dramatic go no go situation. But no, what she's saying there is well, actually. You know, it's about getting to resolutions and it's not always yeah. so dramatic, yep, yep. which is and interesting. Yeah, which is what I understand it to be. But uh, it's it's great that somebody with a law degree who is practicing actually listens to the show and just uh, doesn't doesn't say, whoa, geez, this is the shits and I'm <laughs> going to turn it off. morons. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we admit that we are not lawyers. We're not experts. Oh, God, all I'm of not those. even close. I, no. I do not have the brains to I that. played a defense lawyer in, uh, in high school in law, uh, my law course in grade 12. Okay. And um, they essentially what happened, a guy is accused of murder. Yeah. And uh, there were troubles with the timeline because one of the people playing the police officer screwed up the timelines, like actually just screwed up the script. Okay. But I pounced on that because, well, it, if this was true, then it's not possible that this person was there <laughs> and all of this kind of stuff. And the guy's like, uh, uh, well, no, I actually, I misread it. I did. Uh, and it's like that, but now you're telling me you misread that. And I just went at this guy and That's people so were funny. like, what? Whoa. What's going on? It was very dramatic. And then later, uh, we opened the little container that the guy had written guilty or not guilty in. He yeah. was guilty. And okay. he didn't get off. He went to jail. So, so. You, you played a lawyer. I played a lawyer. Okay. Yes. But uh, yeah, I that that's as close to lawyering as I've ever I gotten. I slept with a lawyer once. You... <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> it always has to devolve into that. I'm sorry, everyone. It's Okay. <laughs> It's okay. You got to do your thing. It's, it's me. Whatever floats your, you know, boat. Ra your rainbow colored boat. <laughs> exactly. Okay, let's listen to another one. Hey guys, my name is Hannah. I'm calling from Peterborough, Ontario. Um, I've been listening to you guys for a while now. I think I started in about 2018. Um, always been really interested in true crime. And then just in the past year, it's become even better because I started working as a social worker at a jail here. So it's been really interesting to, you know, see your side of crime and then, um, you know, the side that I see. And uh, it's really interesting because, you know, even some of the people who maybe have done pretty horrific things, you get talking to them and you realize um, sometimes they're, you know, they're just people and sometimes they don't fully understand what it is they're doing. Um, so, you know, it can be sad in that way as well, but I just wanted to call. I've been thinking about calling for a while. Um, so yeah, thanks for everything you do and I will be listening to you soon. Bye. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Peterborough. Peterborough. Peterborough, Ontario. Lots of Ontarians calling Matthew. They, they must feel now that one of their own is on the show that they, they must chime in. Exactly. Yeah. Not to mention the fact that it's most populous populated province in the country yeah 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 well it's that sort of like why does every so everyone over here in bc right whenever a lottery winner wins in ontario everyone goes online like everyone always wins in ontario i don't do that it's rigged it's like it's because it's like 12 times the size of bc and yeah, there's more people yeah anyway but yeah <laughs> Let's listen to another voicemail. Hi there, guys. This is Alexandra from London, Ontario. I uh, delayed calling just because I thought you guys might get inundated with calls from lawyers regarding your question the other week about lawyers' def uh, responsibility when they know that their client, a defendant, is guilty. So I didn't want to respond right away just in case you guys had lots of feedback. Anyhow, um, Lawyers are governed by the various law societies in their provinces, and there are rules because while we are officers of the court, we are also advocates on behalf of our clients. So it's a really tricky position when we know that our client is guilty. Um, it, it ties our hands in terms of what we can do in terms of our defense. We can't bring false evidence in front of a court because that interferes with our, um, our role as an officer of the court. So. Um, it limits what we can do, but we can still test the evidence presented by the Crown. We can test the jurisdiction. We can um, 
do all sorts of things that don't make it so that we're being false to the court. So in any event, that's uh, kind of a summary of what lawyers can do and uh, whether they choose to leave a client or not. It's it's very individual, uh, on an individual basis, but the problem is that, you know, defense lawyers are needed to have our system of justice function, so we kind of don't want defense lawyers to leave their clients behind. So, uh, you know, otherwise our our system of justice would really grind to a halt. So it's a, it's a necessary part of our system continuing to function, and uh, some people don't understand it, but if uh, you're called to this, you really do understand that everyone does need an advocate, whether good, bad, or indifferent. So in any event, just wanted to give that sort of length of message, and uh, bye. Well, there you go. Another defense attorney calling it, and, and, and a sort of a different take there in Ontario, but the same. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so they really have each other's backs, I yeah, think. that's great. Yeah, it was really great. I, I love this information. We should ask questions more. I was just thinking that. like, I, We should just ask occasionally because these are really smart people who know what they're talking about that can help. Again, I am I am so surprised that people with law degrees and practicing are actually listening to the show. Maybe they do listen and make fun of us and just <laughs> say, "Oh, what dumb dumbs these guys I are." I don't know. I think they both sounded like fans. They did. Yeah, yeah they did. But uh, I'm sure there are others out there who listen to us as uh, you know, ironically. Oh, maybe man. it's it's like listening to Rick Astley. You you yeah. listen ironically. And was that was that Alexandra? I think so, yeah. Yeah, in London, Ontario. Shout out to the home Again, area. Again, your peeps keep My keep peeps. calling in. But uh, no, that was a great voicemail, and we really, really appreciate uh, you taking your, your time away from your busy schedule to, to give us a brief That's of that. Great. Because, yeah, we know that. I, I really like both of those. Mm-hmm, yeah. yeah. Cool. But, so, we doctor, if there's any doctors out there, why does it hurt when I do this with my arm? <laughs> Uh, oh dear. He was actually lifting his arm. Yeah, I was people. actually doing that because it's it's a really great thing for podcasting, visual podcasting. <laughs> That's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one eight seven seven three two seven five seven eight six or one eight seven seven D A R K P T N. We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. Well, it looks like we have one patron this week, and Mm -hmm. uh, I think we might have mentioned it before, but Rob M. emailed us and sent us a voicemail and some messages on Patreon, apparently, (laughs) Patreon, which I don't check, and I probably should. Rob says that he Uh got the patronage for his girlfriend, Julie Renault. Julie Renault. And she is from Windsor, Ontario. There you go. Windsor. What do you think that Julie Renault, our blue noser, who I'm going to talk to very soon, mm. apparently she wants to chat with me. I don't know why, but anyway, <laughs> she wants to have a conversation with me. So I'm going to. What do you think she does there in Windsor, Ontario, Matthew? I think the nickname for Windsor is either. The Garden City or the City of Roses? Okay. So I think she is a horticulturalist. A horticulturalist? Mm-hmm. Well, that's nice. Yeah. Isn't that a fancy name for landscaper? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. I don't know. I don't know what these people Julie do. Julie is not a landscaper. I'm just being She's funny. a horticulturalist. She's a horticulturalist. Yeah. And so what do horticulturalists actually do? They culture things. They culture... Yeah. Oh, do, oh dear! Yeah. I almost said something nasty. No, do you don't be horrible. So she she makes sure that beautiful plants live. That's what she and does. exist together. And, yes, yeah, in, in harmony. Yeah, in gardens. I look at a landscape architecture as a thing. I'm you know I'm being funny when I say I don't know what a horticulturalist is, but I looked at landscape architecture as a thing because it's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Oh, this is really funny. So I got a text from our concierge yesterday. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Just to let you know that the landscaping company will be near your unit on Monday from 2 to 4.30. 
How is the so, landscaping company so I going? Texted, I'm like, I'm in the penthouse on the 39th floor. There is no land. And they're like, we were just given your unit number and told to tell you. <laughs> I, I think in landscaping, cloudscaping, maybe, right? It's cloudscaping. <laughs> oh, gosh. Or, or maybe they're going to come up and do your, uh, do your place. Well, we do our place. Well, yeah, but still. But anyway, thank you so much, Rob and Julie. Yeah. Um, from Windsor. And Rob, thanks for uh, defending the honor and making sure we did a good shout out for Julie. There you go. And it looks like we have a few donut money donors, maybe to make up for things. Um, Mia Belanger says, this is the high schooler from Thunder Bay who called a few months back. Hope you spend this well. To be honest, I'd get a honey cruller. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Mia. You, Mia, that's great. And what does Mia do there in Thunder Bay? What, she's a high schooler, but maybe she has some special like after school job or something like that. She's a thundercat. A thundercat. Yeah, she transforms that night. Yeah. And, and she... Um, saves people and we were a bit old for that uh cartoon thunder thunder did, thundercats or did you watch it yeah i watch cartoons all the time do you yeah i used to get high and watch cartoons but not anymore not anymore next up we have uh Lori habkirk hello Lori. Lori habkirk coffee donuts poutine cruffins maple sugar candy etc what's a cruffin I think that's a croissant muffin, a maybe? Cr a croissant muffin, wow. Cruffin? Yeah, that sounds really yummy, actually. Now I want a cruffin. We had Big Macs and cheeseburgers for lunch, but... <laughs> <laughs> and I totally overdid it. I was late, everyone, because <laughs> I was looking at the clock on the rental car, and yeah. it was late. So I'm like, doity doity, and Mike texts me, are you all right? <laughs> I thought, I seriously thought you were in a ditch. <laughs> I was like, Matthew is never, ever late. It's not like I was concerned that we weren't going to get the show. So done. I got us each a Big Mac with two cheeseburger oh chasers. Oh my God, I ate too much. Um, but what does Lori Habkirk do? And where does she live? That's interesting. Lori mm -hmm. is from, and this is a, a real name of a place. Okay. Titty Hill, England. Okay, I'm trying to remain not... It, it's in Sussex. Giggly. It's in Sussex. Oh, and is, is, are there two hills? <laughs> and you can actually, if it's a great place to base yourself, and you can uh, take nearby day trips to Wet Wang and Shitterton. <laughs> this is all 100% true. Titty Hill. Wet Wang and Shitterton. So well, she's, from, she's from Titty Hill. And what... <laughs> What does she do in Titty Hill? <laughs> she a lingerie salesman? No, I think, I think she, um, I think she has a dairy farm. <laughs> <laughs> or should it be called Titty Hill? <laughs> Help! <laughs> oh dear! I need an adult. <laughs> oh goodness! Oh no! Oh, I'm off. Titty Hill. Titty. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wonder people, what the, what's what, the slogan what, of Titty Hill? <laughs> what were people thinking? I don't know. What would the slogan of Titty Hill be? I don't know. Maybe think about it and, and we'll move on to the next one. <laughs> oh. uh, Titty Hill. <laughs> okay, next up we we're have... We're so juvenile. Yes, we are. From Cambridge, Ontario, Diane Reed. Hello, Diane Reed. Thank you for the donut money. Diane says, long time listener, just wanted to say I appreciate all the work you put into this show. Get some snacks on me and some treats for Steve. Lots of people don't forget Steve. I know, they're... which is lovely. It is lovely. He is a lovely, lovely dog. I love Steve so much. I like, I honestly want you guys to go on vacation so I can come dog sit. Yeah. And I really do. And I'm so glad that you want to do that because it's so stressful when mm -hmm. when we do go away and i need to find a place for him yeah i just want to i want to help him stay home and i want to chill out in the just, like, chill out in the pad in the pad yeah yeah in you the have, eagle's you, nest you have better audio visual equipment than we do though well that's fine you can bring your tv with you it's okay like whatever <laughs> whatever um yeah, so thank you thank you diane did we say what she does 
No. no. Where is she from? Diane is from... So what does Diane do there in Cambridge, Ontario, Matthew? She is a lecturer at Cambridge University. There's a Cambridge University in Ontario? I don't know. Because <laughs> I am going to Cambridge University when I'm in the UK in that July. That made me think of this. I'd like to think there's at least a satellite uh, university. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to go to Cambridge to go to the Society for Psychical Research. And it is also the alma mater of Alistair Crowley, who also had um, a bit of a friendship with a guy who was a member of the OTO, which is that sort of thelemic organization here in Vancouver. So we could actually do Alistair Crowley as a straight up episode of Dark Poutine because he hung out here in Canada at times. That'd be cool. Yeah, it would. Let's do it. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much, Diane Thanks, Reed. Diane. Much appreciated. And uh, let's, and I guess that's it for Donut Money and, and Patreon for the week. There we go. Okay. Until we return, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. No, don't do that. Don't do what? Be a bad apple. Yeah, don't. Be bad apples. Be, hey. What? Be a good Easter egg. It's yeah. Easter. Well, Easter will be, I guess it's Easter no, Monday, Easter when, Monday. This, when this releases. Yeah. But yeah, be a good Easter egg. There you go. The bunny left you some good Easter eggs. Matthew didn't bring me any chocolate though. Mm, I gave a bunch to Justin to this morning. Well. I hid eggs around the house and little notes of things that he can cash in. My dad used to do that. Oh. Like Rachel and I, we would have to go and hunt down clues. Dad would leave like little clues all around, like a note. Yeah. Saying, go here. Okay. Go here. Nice. Go here and look for this. So, um, you can get yourself some chocolate. All the Easter bunnies will be like more than half off tomorrow. So that's true. Yeah. And it'll be more than half off after I bite into it. <laughs> it'll be half gone. Oh, yeah. Okay. Bye everybody. Bye.